högt in i kåren utrånen akad av oss utrånen hilskelse i en esuljet av fyrtio år sedan för liv president of the Royal Irish Academy president of the university distinguished guests it's a great pleasure to be with you and it gives me great pleasure to open this discourse of the Royal Irish Academy on international human rights and democratic public ethics. Now today's uh, event, as you have just heard, is kindly hosted by the University of Limerick and held under the auspices of the initiative that I have launched, the President of Ireland's Ethic Initi Ethics Initiative. This is an initiative I launched in November 2013 with a view to stimulating discussion across all sectors of Irish society on the challenges of living together, living together ethically at this beginning of the 21st century. So I do want to thank the Royal Irish Academy for their support and encouragement of this initiative. And I also do want to thank not just the university in general and its president and its staff, but the, the Rala Hines Centre for Utopian Studies, who have valuably contributed to this wide-ranging reflection uh, on ethics by instigating discussions on a number of topics, including one that was discussed today uh, at one o'clock, uh, one on the question, is an ethical journalism ever possible? Uh, and then in the coming months, they will, we will be back again when I was delighted to learn that the theme of critical pedagogy in the contemporary Irish university uh, was identified by the Rana Hines Centre as a suitable topic, and I very much look forward to that. I've met some participants in the initiative from the University of Limerick in the last hour, and I want to thank them for all they are doing, indeed, as your president say, in the outreach of the University of Limerick in the rural communities. Of the 50 initiatives in the first calendar of events, 14 are in combination between University of Limerick and University College Cork. And now we are just preparing a second calendar of events. Let me say straight away that in the face of the crisis precipitated by the global financial meltdown of 2008, a crisis that has not only economic, but also political, social, intellectual and moral ramifications, and more broadly in the face of the great challenges confronting our contemporary societies, be it in relation to development in technology and science, and their, their delivery to society in a way that is socially inclusive the scale of migrations globally, or indeed global climate change. Universities, I believe, are now called upon to recover the moral purpose of original thought and pluralist emancipatory scholarship. There is, in particular, a pressing need for a critical examination of some of the core assumptions that underpin the social sciences, including, in particular, the discipline of economics as it is currently taught in university departments in the world. Such teaching has sweeping repercussions, after all, on the conceptions that inform policy making, media representations, and more generally, contemporary public discourse on what constitutes prosperity or the good life. Universities have a crucial role to play, I believe, in crafting an intellectual response, for example, to the widespread unquestioned acceptance of the myth of the self-regulating market. Located as it is in that extraordinary hubris which emerged by way of response to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the demise of state socialism. It is this conviction that universities must and can play an important part in nurturing alternative ways of thinking which prompted me in the first instance to invite Irish third-level institutions and the Royal Irish Academy to partake and give a lead in what is, I admit, for them an unorthodox and maybe slightly hazardous endeavour aimed at invigorating a wide public debate on ethics. And I find it greatly encouraging the positive response that Irish universities gave to my invitation the profusion, as I've said, of stimulating ideas that they put forward, 
and their commitment initially to organise over 50 events during this year and beyond, ending up with the final reflection in the spring of 2015. And my hope is that having gained traction among students and academics, that the debate on ethics will also garner momentum at all levels of Irish society. And the strength of the University of Limerick's initiative is that it has already begun this task by reaching out to communities, both urban and rural. I'm also conscious of the difficulties in, the, in getting ethics, as Conor Geerty puts it, out of the ivory tower and the pulpit, back into the market square. But I trust that such an endeavour can resonate with the wider public for the simple reason that it is a reflection many Irish citizens have already undertaken. And this sensibility that I speak of, I identify as being already there in, for example, the culture and music of our country. As members of a small society which has been affected more than most by the global financial crisis, Irish people have been led to an abrupt realisation that the challenge of living together in a creative, harmonious way that permits a flourishing of human capability cannot be met, indeed can be contradicted by an uncritical adjustment to the unaccountable consequences of economic, of economic, of economistic visions of life, of a placing of the market and an aggressive individualism at the centre of public policy and private ambition. Even if not articulated or widely covered in the media, I believe that Irish and European publics are fully aware that humans are far less calculating than the so-called economic man of the contemporary economics textbooks, and that the invitation to view the world as rational, self-interested utility maximizers has inflicted deep injuries on our moral imaginations, on how we conceive our relations with others at home and abroad and with our natural environment. I believe, in other words, that our citizens are willing to move beyond justifiable anger and recrimination, are seeking a space for a reflection, for an authentic new idea in an impoverished intellectual present. They are eager to discuss a new set of principles by which they might represent and project their lives together, and with all those with whom we share our common and fragile planet. And as we might seek to do so, not only as a clarification of the place and role of international human rights in shaping public ethics and democratic practice necessary, but our scholarship has to go beyond simply describing the difficulties of definition and ideal compliance. It must lodge these issues for discussion and resolution in the minds of the publics involved. The language of human rights has, of course, become an essential part of our contemporary political discourse. Yet the breadth of that discourse, the many paradoxes and the variety of meanings ascribed to those rights in contemporary scholarship and in public debate, requires, I believe, renovation. I salute the Royal Irish Academy's decision then to dedicate one of the discourses to these important issues. And I very much look forward to hearing Professor Bellamy's suggestions as to how, for example, we can flesh out the democratic legitimacy of international human rights conventions. We in Ireland, in recent years, have been aware of the intense debate in the United Kingdom concerning the legal position of the European Convention within the British constitutional system. The legal and political context in Ireland is different from the United Kingdom in a number of important respects, not least with regard to our own constitutional rights framework which can only be amended by popular referendum. Yet there are issues we share and challenges that must concern us as Irish, European and global citizens. Ireland faces profound questions about the application and democratic accountability of human rights, including in their social, economic and cultural articulation. In this introduction, I content myself with just outlining briefly some of what I believe of, are the unavoidable complexities inherent in the contemporary human rights discourse 
and which I spoke of which I spoke last year and earlier this year. Starting with the problematic matter of the very foundation of human rights, if not, as some have argued, the impossibility of any consensus on such foundation, now that we've distanced ourselves from the idea of natural rights, I reject, of course, the pessimist conclusion. We have made advances and with good results, but we are left with some basic questions. Is the proclaimed universality of human rights founded on immutable values, or does it result from agreements among governments? This is an important question. Indeed, as Hannah Arendt has shown, the national appropriation of human rights, their entanglement with citizenship, has given rise to new categories of persons without rights, such as refugees, displaced and stateless persons. How are we to conceive of the rights of these people, many stateless, whose number is in the millions of the world today? Contemporary discussions of human rights also resurrect, of course, an older and recurring debate about cultural relativism. And surely the critique is valid of those who oppose a hegemonic version of liberalism which simply seeks to universalise Western ideas of democracy, dignity and individualism at the expense, critiques would argue, of non-European conceptions of selfhood, dignity and the good. These are issues which I addressed at length in the speech I gave to UNESCO in Paris in February 2013, drawing in particular on the work of Professor Mark Goodale. And there exists also a rich intellectual controversy as to whether human rights should be seen as primarily collective rather than individual, social and economic and cultural, as well as political and civil, or associated with equality rather than liberty. However one positions oneself in those discussions, it seems to me important that we bear in mind the implicit ideology that was carried by the 1948 Declaration and the huge body of texts inspired by it. We may need, as Hannah Arendt would put it, to unlearn some of these assumptions so as to be able to redefine and experience human rights in contemporary circumstances. As French social theorist Jean Luc Nancy, among many others, reminds us, this ideology is that of a humanism that has been represented as of European origin, which in its idealistic construction, as I put it, does not think the humanitas of man high enough, as Heidegger wrote, or Pascal in another expression had said the same thing in a different way. Man with a capital M infinitely surpasses man with a small m. According to Nancy, the risk in writing off all these references is that human rights will more or less end up, as he put it, floating on the surface of the icy water of egotistical calculation. Finally, when discussing human rights, one cannot dispense with a serious analysis of some of the disturbing uses which have been made of the term in the decades since the end of the Cold War as a rhetoric of abuse on so many occasions. In an article from the recent book he co-edited with Costas Duzinas, The Meanings of Rights, the Philosophy and Social Theory of Human Rights, Conor Geerty identifies two chief manipulations undergone by human rights over the last 20 years. The first consists in the projection of human rights as a cultural value possessed by Western liberal democracies as opposed to an enemy other. Such a distortion was manifest, for example, in the rhetoric of the war on terror, whereby human rights were recast as the ethical prerogative of the dominant culture and the coalition for war. Secondly, Geary warns against a legalist definition of rights, allowing for a widening of the gap between declarations of rights and their application and enforcement. Indeed, these days, few countries in the world are without a constitution guaranteeing the rule of law and the constitutional protection of human rights. We have witnessed a proliferation of pseudo-democracies whose governments proclaim human rights but but depart from them in practice. Yet I agree with Conor Geerty when he argues that however dangerous these distortions are and we must do whatever is in our power to redress them, we cannot afford to dismiss the Human Rights Project for all that. We have precious few other examples 
of normative guidance at our disposal in today's world. As Conor Gerty put it, wrong turnings are inevitable in a journey as ambitious as this, an effort to persuade the world that not only my blood brother, but also the unknown stranger, is worthy of my care. Thus, the human rights movement can be described as an ongoing struggle to close the gap between the abstract man of the declarations and the empirical human being in all its diversity, an expression of our understanding of what it means to be human and to resist abuses of power, whether they are directed at our own community or towards a people of whom we have simply become aware through education, information or modern communication. As Goethe points out, the word struggle is important here, for it is, as he put it, about the powerless stepping into the light, as well as about the, power, the powerful to have better eyesight. Human rights continue to inform popular uprisings against oppressive rule. They remain an important part of the philosophy and practice of emancipation. And in anticipation of Professor Bellamy's speech this evening, they have the capacity to play an essential and invaluable role in enriching the political discourse of our sophisticated democratic systems. So I very much welcome the Royal Irish Academy in Deveret thinking through the meaning and place of human rights in our ethical project. And my hope is that today's discussion will contribute to foster an ethic of human rights, not just a specialism, but as a popular practice. I very much look forward to Professor Bellamy's lecture and thank you. Got a meal